Hallo? Ah, perfect. So, uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm David, uh, and I'm a PhD student working with uh, Gabor Chani in uh, Cambridge in the engineering department. And so today, we will actually give a joint talk with Ilias, who is in the audience. So we'll join our talks, uh, and we will talk about a work that we have been doing over the past year or so. And um, it will be about generalized atomic cluster expansion. Uh, and so let's see what I'll talk about. Basically, in the past years, uh, there were two big advances in the field of like machine learning for materials. And one of them was atomic cluster expansion uh, that Boris mentioned. The other one is probably uh, NACWIP. Yeah. To share the screen. Share the screen. Yes. yes. OK. So. So basically, um, all the motivation for this work uh, that we started about a year ago was to, to look at uh, this atomic cluster expansion and, you know, which was a, basically a huge advance because it really put all of the atom density based representations on the same footing. And then there was this message passing and equivariant message passing networks like NACWIP, which achieved, uh, um, you know, even better accuracy than the previous atom uh, centered representation based, based models. So we created uh, uh, this framework called Multiase, and this really builds on, on the ideas that have been around for a long time. So basically, Rishi Condor has been thinking about this a lot, Michele Ceriotti as well. They have a recent uh, preprint. Um, and the idea is that how do we kind of unify or how do we connect these atom density based representations and uh, message passing uh, networks? So what I, we will present today is, is a very careful formulation, uh, which we believe really helps highlight the, the key uh, connections and helps us understand, for example, what makes uh, NACWIP as good as it is. And so in particular, I will, in the first half of the talk, talk about something that I call here generalized equivariant ACE. So ACE is the atomic cluster expansion. And I'll just show a few results as well, uh, what a single ACE layer can do. Um, okay, now it stopped. Okay, so just uh, this is this will be very brief because I think uh, everybody in the audience kind of has seen this, but but we want to uh, represent atomic structures on computers, and these structures are usually made up of particles, and the particles have uh, two types of things. So one of them is the position, so they are embedded in three dimensional space, and the other one is something that I call here attributes, which is uh, say a chemical element, it can be a charge or any other fixed property that defines the system. And then we want to do some machine learning on this structure. And for that to do machine learning, we need to represent the atoms on the computer. And obviously this kind of X, Y, Z representation is not going to be the best we can do. So the question is, how do we transform this into something that's more suitable for machine learning? And then we want to predict something, for example, the potential energy uh, most of them. So what are the symmetries of the representation that we need? And, and so here I, I just want to, before or else, introduce some notation. So whenever you see sigma, sigma will be basically this configuration which describes the state of an atom. So an atom will have a position and then it will have these attributes, which are, for example, what is the chemical element? And then there can be also some learnable features. So, you know, in NACVIP there were some learnable features which were maybe vectors or tensors. Um, so the usual target properties will have some symmetries. Um, so, you know, potential energy will be invariant, binding affinity uh, will be again invariant, something like a dipole moment uh, can be like a vector. Um, so, but anything that has a symmetry will obey some kind of symmetry relationship. So say you have a model phi and you, you apply a transformation Q on your inputs and you make a prediction. And then if, if your model is equivariant, that means that your, you could have actually made the prediction on the original system and then apply the transformation. So if your model is invariant, then transforming the coordinates and then computing the energy is, is the same as computing the energy and then transforming. If it's equivariant, so if it's something like a vector, then if I predict this vector on the transformed, that is the same as predicting the, the vector on the original and then doing the transformation. So this is, this is kind of an, what the equivariance is. And if you want to represent equivariant properties, then we need to choose a basis for it. And the basis that uh, we will talk about uh, or that we use for this multi-case framework is the, the spherical representation of the tensors. So basically, uh, kind of like the, the, the atomic orbitals. So L equals zero is this spherical and then L equals one uh, is going to be uh, these kind of p orbital like and this is important because the l equals one spherical vectors are 
the same as this Cartesian vector. So, so for example, other some neural networks like pain use Cartesian vectors, but they are just up to change of basis equivalent to using spherical. And the M just in the indexes these. Um, and then the model predictions should be consistent with uh, the symmetries uh, by design. So we want to create models that have these symmetries built in. Um, okay, and then the symmetries will be uh, translation, rotation, and permutation, uh, as Boris said, and probably all the other speakers before. Um, okay, so what, do you, what, what, what is generalized atomic cluster expansion? So first, before going there, so the atomic cluster expansion is this framework uh, that, um, of symmetric polynomials that was introduced in sort of 2019 by, by Ralph Droughts, and um, it builds a complete uh, polynomial basis for atomic environments. Uh, and the most basic building block is uh, something called the one particle basis, and that has this kind of form. Okay, so what, what, is, what is this? It has a radial part. Uh, which uh, takes the argument, the distance between the atoms, and then it has an angular part, uh, which takes these uh, unit vectors on the sphere as arguments, and this will represent all of the angular information about the environment. And so RJI, I is our central atom, and J is one neighbor. So this is, in some sense, an edge feature, uh, right? It is a, a feature that is connected to the RJI pair. So what we want to generalize this because this, as it is, wouldn't really fit uh, in with uh, something that, like a neural network. So we came up with a generalized one particle basis. And this is going to be a bit tricky. So the generalized one particle basis will still keep the radial part, okay? It adds on the distances. It still keeps the angular part, but then it also has this T, which is a very peculiar object. And T basically is everything that is not radial and angular. And that will describe the dependence on, for example, the, the chemical elements. Okay? And this allows us to generalize this one particle basis from the, the having uh, species indices to, for example, continuous embeddings of neural networks. Okay? And then we have two indices here of T, the K and the C. And this will be something that becomes very clear later. Uh, but basically the key is that one of them, uh, we, we, we have this degree of freedom of collecting different uh, indices into one or, or, into one or either K or V. And you will see in two slides time <laughs> what, what the point of that is, but it's just an, uh, something we can, we can do in, in the theory. And just to, to sort of give some examples of what TK can be. So if you want to recover the previous uh, one particle basis with the species index, then we can encode the neighbor chemical elements into this TKC. Okay, so we want to recover this type of functional form, then we can say that, okay, TKC should be essentially an index selector. So if theta i is zi, so if, if theta i is the ith atomic number, then um, and it will select basically this TKC will select a uh, chemical element zi and chemical element zj and then kind of pick the corresponding radial basis okay so here the radial basis depends on what is, is the carbon hydrogen radio base the carbon carbon radial basis and then here it is agnostic but it has the index c and that index c will now correspond to picking the tkc will pick the correct carbon hydrogen radial basis, for example. Okay, and if we have uh, uh, channels with uh, with chemical embeddings, then the, again that can be expressed. So this TKC could map, for example, the chemical elements into some continuous space as well, like the neural networks do. And then uh, this TKC could also introduce other dependencies. So, for example, there is a magnetic moment or or a dipole on the on the neighbor atom. Then that could also uh, be uh, in incorporated into this framework via these TKC functions. And this also doesn't have to be invariant, so it can have an equivariant output, and then uh, that would be expressed in a spherical basis, and then C or K would, for example, collect the LM indices of the symmetries of this output of this TKC. Okay? So, moving on. What can we do? So, this one particle basis is essentially an edge feature. So, now we can collect it, so we collect uh, by a kind of like a message passing away uh, into, into these A basis. So this A basis is just summing over the neighbors, these edge features, okay? So it's basically like a message passing network, but also like ACE. So this is ACE notation. So A is the atomic base or the permutation invariant basis set in an atomic cluster expansion. So all we have done is we summed over the neighbors, this one particle basis. And then we will create higher order basis functions. So why do we do that? Basically it is, known to be a systematic approximation of, of, for example, a function of an atomic environment, uh, it, it can be systematically expanded in this many-body expansion, okay? So many-body expansion is essentially taking a property of atom i and saying that it depends on its own, what, what atom i is, and it depends on 
terms that sum over atom i and one neighbor, atom i and two neighbors, and so on. So this is one body, two body, three body, and so on. And we can parameterize each of these terms with these A basis functions, okay? So if you look at it, we have a, a shift, a one body energy, and then we can have two body energy. So this A i was basically a sum over neighbors of two body things. So that, that can parameterize any two body functions. We have started with a complete basis. And then if you, if you take products, then what you get is basically three body functions, right? Because you had the I and then one neighbor, and then the other A depends on I and then another neighbor. So if you product them together, then you get these uh, three body terms. And this actually is very similar to Allegro, right? Because in Allegro, you also had edge features and then you product, tensor product them together. And we do the same here uh, with the YLMs. It's essentially the same kind of tensor product. And you can see that we only take the tensor product over the V indices. So that's why we had two indices, K and V, because we can have the freedom of mixing some channels and not mixing others. And then, uh, so we create this product basis, uh, ball A, which is now a many body uh, basis function. And it can, we can go to arbitrary high body order at very low cost uh, this way. So without having to actually sum over all triplets and quadruplets and so on. Um, so now all we have left is to actually uh, do something with rotational symmetry, which we have uh, ignored so far, but we haven't quite ignored it, obviously. Um, so what we then do is we have to symmetrize uh, these, these A basis functions so that we get we pick out the correct uh, equivariance that we want as the output. And basically, you don't need to, to worry about the, the maths. The, the, what we do is we have to take an appropriate average of these spherical harmonics in the rotations. And um, the key is that we did use uh, the, the, these YLMs to parameterize all of the angular dependence. So then we can use the, the spherical harmonic um, kind of algebra, uh, you know, from angular momentum, like big Russian books. And then uh, we can look up what is the correct kind of coefficients, uh, like generalized Klebs Gordon coefficients, that, you know, if you sum these, uh, the, these products of YLMs, you be using the appropriate uh, coefficients, then you can get out, for example, big L, big M symmetry features. Okay, and then here, so basically what I am showing here is that how we can create from these many body A basis functions with the appropriate coefficients, arbitrarily symmetric many body functions. Okay, and that is, the, that is kind of like a generalized ACE feature. Um, so basically we get then the output by, by taking these features and applying some weights to them. Um, and if you wanted to reduce this to, to you know, original droughts linear ace, then we would need to take k equals one. So you have only one, there is no uncoupled channel. You take the product over everything and then L equals zero, M equals zero would be the invariant, the energy, for example. So now I, I think that was uh, the, the theory. And uh, so from here on, I will just show a few uh, results of, of invariant and equivariant ace as a single generalized one ace layer. And then uh, Ilias will continue by showing how you can connect this to, to the message passing networks. Um, so we, what we have done first is, okay, we have now these many body basis functions of ACE and they are super efficient to compute. So the question is, can we actually just do linear regression on them without having to go to neural networks or kernels? And what we have found is that, um, what you can see here is that in, in something as easy as MD17, even with linear regression, you can be uh, kind of on par with, with most of the previous methods, uh, including uh, some uh, um, uh, message passing neural networks, even some L equals one uh, equivariant neural networks. Um, but then you, ca you can't quite be on par with, with something like NACRIP. So, so clearly there is, there is something missing in, in simple linear A's. Uh, uh, from from uh, from from the graph neural network, well, from 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 an equip, and uh, maybe Ilias will will maybe uh, talk more about uh, how to go from ACE to quite there. Um, so then, just a few other illustrations is this data set that Boris also mentioned. Uh, you can see that if you tra train the potential energy of this molecule at 300 Kelvin configs only, then you only uh, take certain uh, stable combinations of angles in your training set. And then when you test at high temperature, there is a much broader distribution. So this is a very good kind of challenging benchmark data set. And you can see that ACE does uh, uh, really well uh, compared to other methods. Um, and then we can also fit equivariant properties. So I just want to show here, uh, this is percentage error on negative neutron positive water clusters. And now the dipole moment is an equivariant rotating quantity. And again, just with a linear ACE, we can get a very, very accurate dipole. So the neutral ones have a bit higher fractional error, uh, but uh, 
and that, that, that corresponds to uh, uh, you know, much smaller dipoles in absolute value, whereas the negative and positive clusters have much higher errors. Um, so basically in absolute terms, this is like 0.01 Debye or smaller errors that we get using single uh, linear regression on, 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 uh, with this equivariant uh, ACE. Um, and with that, uh, I just wanted to show one more thing that we can then do use these dipoles, for example, as the long range part of a potential plug them into, uh, into the you know, Coulomb law of dipoles and then parameterize an ACE for the short range part uh, of a residual. And then we can run reactive molecular dynamics of, for example, of, of water clusters um, using proper short range and long range uh, included. So here you can see like a, a proton kind of migrating around in, in, a, in a cluster. So to conclude, Atomic cluster expansion is, is this very systematic framework where to create efficient symmetric representations of high body order. And then we can generalize this uh, and it can be invariant, but also equivariant. And we can also include continuous embeddings into atomic cluster expansion. And uh, so we've, most of this work is actually in a preprint that we will upload uh, later this week uh, online. And this was a, um, a work jointly done with the, with the group of, of uh, Boris, uh, especially investigating the connections to NACWIP. And uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, and uh, so we will, just to point out next Wednesday, there will be a much longer talk, uh, like an hour and a half that we will give with Ilias on, on this. And so I think I'll just give the floor to him and maybe we can take questions together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the floor to Ilias for the second part of the joint talk. And as David said, the questions will be taken at the end of all of this. So in 10, 20, 15 minutes.